Hey, what's going on, you radical dreamers? Welcome to episode 51 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want. We try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. Chrono Trigger is one of the best of the best. If you've never played it, you gotta. And if you have, you're in for a real treat because I found some really cool stuff. And hey, thank you Straight Jeffin for doing this week's animated intro. Good stuff, man. But with that said, let's get going. So the very first thing I want to talk about is this really interesting scene found by this YouTuber named Nervash. And oh my god, what an amazing find. See, what he found here was that inside of Janice's room is a bookcase that has a secret trigger into an odd looking scene. Now I've seen the speculation in his own comment section whether or not this is an unused ending, or just plainly a glitch, or a random composition of RAM. Now one thing that Nervash did not show in his clip was that if you make your way over to this scene quick enough, you can actually see animations from characters that can be easily missed. For example, this gentleman over here drinking some beer before getting shocked by Ayla, as well as new looking up before looking shocked. Now another thing that Nervash overlooked was that if you have Luca and Marl, or Marley, in your party, when you activate this scene, they'll actually show up in the scene themselves and have their own animations. Now I did try this with every other character in the game, including Magus, which was quite the pain because he's not supposed to be in your party yet, and there's no codes to implant characters into the game. But I found a way! And no, none of the other characters have anything to do with this scene if you put them in your party. However, these two characters do show up if you have them there. So now that we have more pieces of the puzzle, it's time to put it together. Ayla shocking the man, Marl laughing, Luca interacting with the new. Now after playing through the game and getting every single ending for this episode, I figured out what this actually belongs to. See what's actually happening here is that when you step on this tile, it's triggering a specific room to a specific cutscene to a specific ending of the game. This cutscene belongs to the ending, What the Prophet Seeks. And as you can see here in this clip, it's nearly identical. Now why there is an exit tile to trigger this in the first place, I'll never know. The game's actually fairly clean and you can very very rarely find other parts of the game that also have random tiles that you can step on and activate things. But at least the theories about what this scene belongs to can finally be put to rest. So if you've seen any of my other Super Nintendo episodes, you already know at this point that every game on Super Nintendo has layers. And so when we remove the first background layer to Chrono Trigger in the teleporter scene, what do you assume will happen? I'm gonna have to guess you weren't thinking big puffy clouds. Now at first glance you're probably thinking this has nothing to do with anything, it's probably a glitch or something. Well. No. Believe it or not, this actually does belong in this scene, as it does with every single area of the game that uses a time warp. This is because, and it's absolutely nuts that someone would go for the trouble for it, but it's for the outer ring effect when you see the portal. Yeah, that extremely negligible part of the portal is, <laughs> is pulled off by an elaborate moving background. So I thought this was kind of neat. The gate key that Luca uses is actually stored in the upper left hand corner of this screen. Now before you guys go off on some wild fan theories about why it has to be there, consider this wild fan theory. In a lot of games, whether it's 2D or 3D, and even in Chrono Trigger itself, oftentimes characters are stored off screen, ready to be queued in for a story scene. And I believe since Luca pulls out the gate key on this screen, the developers place it aside so that it can be used later. So in a lot of shops in Chrono Trigger, there are placeholder objects, whether it be a little land doll or a tiny cat, and even sometimes a mug. All of these are placed in front of shopkeepers in the world of Chrono Trigger. Now I've seen something like this before in Super Mario RPG, where there's an object inside the desk, so your character looks like it's talking to the shopkeep across the desk. And that still could be the case here, but the one thing that's really strange is that this isn't the case for every desk in Chrono Trigger. Some shopkeepers don't have anything in front of them, but they do have a desk. So it, it begs the question, why do some people have it while others don't? So while playing Chrono Trigger, it's a very natural feeling to say to yourself, hey, this room looks a lot like that room, and this area is a little bit similar to that area. Well, then it may come as no shock to find out that these areas are sharing one large map together. For example, here in Guardia Castle in 600 AD, that elongated staircase that keeps branching off into other rooms is actually all connected to each other. And another rule that can apply to almost all maps in the game is that in the very corner are doors and objects that are interacted with in the rooms themselves. Now actually, I thought this was pretty cool. So all those effects that you see in Chrono Trigger, whether it be in a cutscene or opening a book on the floating continent, you would just assume the game can bring those out of thin air. Well, uh, no, not at all. Actually, what's going on here is that the game preloads all these effects into the background, and when they're ready to come into the scene, they change layer priority. So before that scene triggers, the flames are in background layer two, and then when it's needed for the scene, it comes up to the front.
So Chrono Trigger does a lot of interesting tidbits of layers. Like for example, lighting is a separate layer for a lot of things in this game. Like this giant stained glass window in the courtroom. If you remove the lighting effect, you can actually see the true colors of the window that the player is never meant to see. Also, if we remove some more layers, you can see the broken part of the window from a later scene in the game. Just a tiny little thing to note here, this passageway to the outside of the castle is slightly covered up, so if we remove the layers that do, you can see the little pixel picture in full. Maybe I'm just a weirdo, but tell me if you've had the same experience as me as a kid. Seeing all those treasure chests behind the shopkeepers always made me wonder what's inside of them. They're clearly closed, so I imagine if I could get behind there, I could open them up and see what's inside. Unfortunately, after checking every single box in Chrono Trigger, that's not the case. They're all just dummy props, and you can't interact with them whatsoever, except for one box. Here in the very first town of the game, if you get behind this particular counter and try to open this box, you will get 57,342 gil. I gotta say, it's a very unusual amount to give, even if it is for a debug purpose. But you have no idea how satisfying it was to find at least one box that had something inside of it. Hey, you know what? I did not suspend my disbelief here, and I was wrong to do so. See how this grating looks like it has all sorts of gadgets and gizmos underneath it? Well, as it turns out, if you remove the layer on top of it, there really is gadgets and gizmos and pipes underneath this grating. Personally, I would have never guessed. Here at the end of time, you can see good old Gasper sleeping against a light post, and something I found a tad odd is that you can actually remove the light post that Gasper leans against. Or you can remove Gasper himself and find that the end of time actually has an open space for objects to be placed on top of. Now putting Gasper on the sprite layer makes a ton of sense, but honestly caught off guard by the light post. Speaking of little objects and layers, one of the best things about Chrono Trigger is that they dedicate an entire layer for knickknacks. With a push of a button, you can vacate an entire home or building of all of its possessions. And this was done so that the developers could personalize every single building in the game. What objects and how those objects are placed are completely at the discretion of the developers by not having any of these objects automatically connected to a dresser or a tabletop. Although in some cases you end up finding knickknacks where they don't belong. Like for example here, you don't normally find stuff underneath beds, but remove this layer and you can find a pair of knives. Not sure what's going on there. Now here's a relic of trial and error. Here in the scene that leads to Frog's home, you can actually find another bush underneath the animated bush. And although I admit this is speculative, I wouldn't be surprised if someone tested this scene and said, it was kind of hard for me to figure out that you were supposed to go down this bush. And so the developers in post added a greener looking bush that actually animates a little bit. Here in the prehistoric time, I noticed that there's a treasure chest on the wrong layer. And of course, trying to open it won't really do you any good. It's not supposed to be in the game, period. But considering the lack of things you'll find when you remove layers, this is kind of strange. Check out this sprite used to mask up Nisbel as he's coming out of the door. So normally Magus's castle on the overworld map is outside of the player's view. If we were just able to squeeze past that mountain in the south, we'd probably be able to see the entire thing. But because that's never the case, we're never allowed to. Even when you get the epoch later in the game, Magus's castle disappears so you can't see it even then. But what's interesting is that if we move past the boundaries, there is more to this castle. You can actually see the stone dragon that's supposed to rest at the top of it. And if we remove the trees wrapping around it, you can also see the gates to its castle as well. So remember when we were talking about the puffy clouds and how it interacts with the portal? Well, you think that after that whole discovery, I would learn my lesson. But no, I didn't. When we remove a layer in Magus's room, we can find a weird blue mesh. And once again, I thought, oh, this is just some weird glitch. But I was wrong. Once you defeat Magus, you all get sucked into a time portal. But this time portal is just different looking from all the others. And rather than making a similar looking circular time portal like you usually see in the game, they just made the entire background this pattern and created a cookie cut with special effects once the scene is activated. Now normally you cannot touch that red dot in the sky because that red dot's supposed to represent Lavos, not a magic tab or anything else you'd find that's usually a little glittery sparkle on the ground. But what's funny is if we break the boundaries and walk up to said little Lavos glitter spot, you can interact with it in a small way. The game doesn't know what to do once you touch said glitter spot, and so instead, it just turns into a glitchy mess. 
The prehistoric era is a little bit strange compared to the other eras of the game. See, in other eras, removing a certain layer will just take away buildings and other key objects on the map, or just reveal a set piece to be used later in the game. However, the prehistoric era has a massive land in the upper left-hand corner of the map that's never used and never seen. And also, every place that there's supposed to be ocean is replaced with dry land once you remove the layer. Again, this is not something that's typical in any other era of the game. And just so you get a good perspective, I'm going to do a little bit of a zoom out for you. Yeah, some of the stuff that's always bugged me about the floating continent Kingdom of Zeal, there's stuff on other floating islands that you're not allowed to get to. Like, for example, this entire building over here, which apparently you can't go into, uh... And of course, the Prism Pyramid that shows up in the later eras of the game, which you also can't visit. Uh, but I also just wanted to see what happens to the waterfalls. Like, where does it end? And oh, it just, okay, it ends like right off the screen. Cool. All right, gotcha. But is there anything else to see on the screen? <laughs> Not really. Although there is one little funny thing, and that's when you reach the bottom of the map, your allies suddenly get confused about what's the closest route to your character. And so instead of following you down off the side of the map, they start traveling up to meet you at the top. So with the ability to walk through walls and also remove layers, I found out that there is a doorway here that's never used. In both of the secret rooms in the Kingdom of Zeal, both rooms have a wall texture that laps over what was supposed to be a doorway, and it's further evidenced by the fact that above this blank black space is an overhead. Now, any other texture on this wall, Chrono and his gang would walk over it, but because this is supposed to be an overhang, this environment set piece actually covers Chrono. Yeah, it makes you wonder where these doors would have gone at one point. Ah, uh, maybe it would have gone to one of these unused houses in Chorus. Now this is a discovery I didn't make myself, I have to admit this was found on the cutting room floor, which I stumbled upon while verifying whether or not a discovery I made was public or not. But this is incredibly cool and I felt like I had to share it. Just north of the inside of the building of the Chorus Inn in present day is an unused Chorus residence house. Now this house was apparently used in the prototype version of Chrono Trigger, which I didn't even know existed. But before the final release, they gave it the old axe. But unlike some prototype elements that got completely removed from the game cartridge, this one still remains. Really quick, something that I cannot explain is that the door that Shala goes through and then you realize you have to use the same pendant to get through, for some reason has a handmaid and queen lean behind it. Now the handmaid makes a little bit of sense. You walk up to the door and the handmaid acts as a stand-in for some dialogue. Queen Lean, on the other hand, I have no idea. She also shows up in the room on the opposite side. Hey, you might remember this ridiculous boss that was holding Melchior captive. Well, here's another little thing to add to the goofishness of this scene. Apparently you got Melchior attached to this monster's spine. Though you'd never see it, you can see Melchior's little feet dangling from the bottom. And also, when you defeat the boss, you can see a little bit of dialogue that pops up before Melchior comes into the scene. And if you slow it down, you can see that it reads, Miss 89. Oh, guess where I am. How can I do a Boundary Break episode on Chrono Trigger and not talk about 1999 AD? Yeah, for some reason, 80s and 90s films really thought that the apocalypse was going to happen a lot sooner than, well, it actually did. Or will. Ah, I'm getting grim. Anyways, right now we are walking on the map for 1999 AD and you can see everything that this area had to offer. And now it's not a full map, that's why you're seeing so much green here. You're actually looking at nothingness. That is Chrono Trigger's void. But that being said, there's still a lot to look at. Now, are there any access points that allow you to actually go inside these buildings? N no, absolutely not. <laughs> it would have just been a huge waste of time for the developers. Still, it's incredible that we can be walking in this area right now. To a small extent, it's like fulfilling a childhood dream. And before we take off of this area, I figured we could do a zoom out to give you guys a much better idea of the entire area of the map. So I realized that this is Chrono Cross and not Chrono Trigger, but I'm never going to be able to boundary break Chrono Cross. It's just not going to happen. And I figure I have one opportunity to show you guys something Chrono Trigger related that I've always wanted to see, and it's just, it means a lot to me, and so I share it with all of you. In Chrono Cross, you do get to meet Chrono, Marl, and Luca, but it's old PlayStation 1 graphics with tons of aliasing and locked cameras, so you can't see anything other than a blotch that resembles Chrono, Luca, and Marl. Well, I'm wicked happy to report that deep within the catacombs of Chrono Compendium 
Steam.com's forums lies a user named Utunnels, who actually extracted a ton of Chrono Cross models and put them into a model viewer. And so I thought I'd bookend this episode with close-up shots of Chrono, Luca, Marl, and Shala. And hey, thank you so much for watching. If you like these longer episodes and you want to continue to see them weekly, you can always support me on Patreon where there is a link in the video description down below. Straight Jeffin was a really cool dude for helping me out this week by doing the animated intro, and he's starting his own YouTube channel, so if you want to check out his channel, I got you a link down there as well. And if you want to see another Super Nintendo RPG boundary broken, I have a Super Mario RPG episode already out. If you want to check it out, there's a link down below there for you as well. Oh yeah, and I'll also leave a link to all the models that are shown here, including many more, also in the video description down below. Alright, well, that's all I got. I'll see you next week. Take care.